And welcome back, everybody. Welcome to uh, Plato Three of Block One of I almost said uh, I almost said a different podcast name. Welcome everyone to <laughs> Final Gravity. <laughs> so uh, this is Plato Three of Block One. So this is going to be the most intense episode out of this block. Uh, it's been an introduction talking about the history of beer, and now given the uh, current topic of events. We're talking about beer and COVID-19. And of course, the Viking Peach is here. I'll be kind of the host for this episode. And I'm joined, as always, with my two wonderful friends, Cousin T and Groovy Bear. Good to see you, buddy. What up, y'all? Good to see you as well. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Uh, li- you know, living every day, taking it day by day. How are y'all doing? You know, doing drinking right, beer man. and laying low. <laughs> got some got some beers and some kegs. I I made a piece of equipment that looks like it belongs on a fucking space shuttle. That does look pretty cool. Um, I took the the two inch sight glass and those two two inch valves that I have, and I basically made made like a an on tanky yeast brink so I can like cap those off and take the sight glass off and save yeast for a later time to pitch onto other beers. If, it's fucking clever. If I want to. I, I do like that. I like that design. I just need to. I need to get a two-inch cap, so I can cap it off and just put it in the fridge and just leave it there. It, it, it's cool because mm. that sight glass. If I just leave it in the fridge, it looks like something out of a like a superhero movie. Just like I need to take like you open up like that fancy silver case and this is what's sitting in it. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Right, right. It's like glowing. Got a fucking uh, tesseract in there. <laughs> yeah, the tesseract. It's basically yeah. In in, in 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 a whole nother sense. Uh, mm. But anyway. Anyways, um, I guess we, we've got a lot of topics to cover tonight. But uh, really quickly, what are you gentlemen drinking over there in Montana land? CJ is sipping on some fucking dope ass shit. I am here. drinking uh, Samuel Smith Yorkshire Stingo 1758 um, and uh, and digging it. Um, just a kind of an amber ale aged in oak barrels, blended amber ale. It's, um, uh, it's 8% alcohol by volume. It's smooth, vanilla, raisin. It's Samuel Smith all the way. These beers are, uh, nice. in my opinion, super underrated. And when you can get like good Samuel Smith off the shelf, it's still pretty – it's fantastic. So – and I also figured we're in a heavy episode. I'm going to drink some heavy beers. So behind this one, I've got an Imperial Stout yeah. lined up, and it's going to be a good night. Nice. I, I saw the cap on that. Is that a Breakside? It is a Breakside beer. Yeah. Yes. Nice. nice. We'll get to nice. that when that gets cracked open. Oh, nice. I assume the heavy <laughs> political shit will come up, and I will be dumping that beer yeah, into my just glass. pouring that out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, <clears throat> I, am, uh, I am drinking a blend at the moment, a, uh, a, an Orion's Belt house blend. Uh, I have t- two different, Sounds like two fucking different wine. <laughs> Well, I, it's you know what? Given the conversation that we had last episode and what CJ was talking about, it should sound like it's fucking wine because it's just as complicated and it's older. There you go. It's That's true. Mature. It's gone through a longer maturation period. If we're going to make beer puns, <laughs> um. No, I got two beers on tap right now, a 7.6% black IPA and a 4.1% session IPA that I just blended 50-50 in the glass just to give the black IPA a little bit more bite. There was a, pardon me, there's some good dry, uh, like, red fruit notes in that black IPA, but I really, I like the design of the beer was to have more of that. Like, and I, I do get some roastiness from the, from the black malt, but not like it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't milled. It was just steeped in the mash. So it gives it like this silky velvety kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, Texture, body. Te- texture, type type of deal to it, along along with that like uh, that roastiness that comes with black malts, but it's not as like in your face as it would be in like a porter or a stout of some if it were milled. 
Uh, but I think it's I think they're they're both super tasty, and I can't wait to break into that Comet keg and see how I, that one came out. I cannot wait to drink those beers when uh, when a couple bottles end up over here on the yeah, left you, coast. These uh, these two kegs probably have another thirty six hours before carbonation's done, and then nice. the other keg will have a couple of days, and then I'll <clears throat> I'll bottle up three of the individuals, and then I'll I'll do a bottle blend for you on uh on this black and that that four percent i am hyped so, for that yeah and then i think i'm gonna go beer ferry around town because it's like the end of the stay at home and the quarantines and all this it's not the end of the covid19 it's, nonsense it's starting to but loosen it's, regulations it's, it's starting to loosen up so i think i might go beer ferry like one nice. evening you know, around like eight thirty, I feel like that's a good time, right when the sun's going down. Just go knock oh, yeah. on doors and leave growlers and run away and be like, enjoy, courtesy of Orion's Belt Brewing. Happy <laughs> quarantine, corn corn beer. Nice, I love it. Um, yeah, well, over here in Oregon, I am sipping on the Diablo Rojo from Boneyard. It's a good sound. Uh, <laughs> that is a good sound. Nice. Yeah. Um, Little foreshadowing here. Boneyard just started canning their beers right at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, and I personally, I, I'll probably get a lot of flack for this from anyone in Bend except my bartending friends, but I think RPM is overrated, but it's the most popular IPA in Oregon. Uh, that's why I buy all their beer besides RPM. Uh. <laughs> the, the look on CJ's face is just like, I want to tear this dude apart, but he's my friend, so how do I do I, this? <laughs> if, if this was a if this was a one or a two Plato episode, we'd have to we'd have to stop and talk about that. Um, I will I will call my comments by saying that there was a time when Boneyard RPM ruled the west coast scene um and being being someone who's lived in portland a very long time like that that beer um early on before boneyard you know because of their model and everything was forced to scale up that that beer was so insane nowadays it's it's definitely overhyped it's like a song you hear on the radio way too yeah, much it's like free bird um well, all, all still I'll a say good about... song but you know but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't but, get me wrong. I I drink plenty of RPM. I think it's a solid IPA. All I'll say on the subject is, uh, I've had customers walk out of my bar because they were excited for our lunch food, but we didn't have RPM on tap, so they went to lunch somewhere else. That oh so, oh my god, and that is that is um, that is kind of to me a slap in the face as to what craft beer is, and that's a misunderstanding on the consumer as well. That's, uh, but that's 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 what that's all it overhyped and overrated. It's not because I think it's a bad beer. I just think it's overexcited um but the it's, diablo it's, rojo is whew, one of my favorite reds yeah and and all respect to boneyard brewing because they did mm. um did they they, they had a, a model that really changed uh west coast beer but the the diablo rojo really is did amazing. i mean we could talk about how i think plan of the elders is overrated but we will save that for we'll do an overrated beer episode for oh, sure yeah. at some point in time yeah there'll be there'll oh, be a yeah. plate yeah. Over. Yeah. <laughs> and we will probably be disliked by every brewery who now can you know, like is starting to like our potty sierra nevada might be like Send us a middle finger through the Giphy or something like that. They better but, fucking not. I love their shit, but they're overhyped. <laughs> anyway, we'll save that for a different. Oh no, we're, no, 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 no. We're not going to get into that conversation. We're not going to get into that uh, conversation. Uh, yeah, we'll save. Anyway. We'll save uh, this but, for hey, a whole another Plato. Yeah, um, we'll take. Yeah, that's we'll a, that's table. that's another episode. Yeah. Josh, that uh, that gloss that glassware looked uh, that glossware. I don't know the why gloss. I'm speaking like yes, uh, the poor uh, decisions glass getting fancy up in here. Got that gold trim right around the top, that gold logo embellished right here, and of course, poor decisions written right across the back. Love it. Poor dis- shout out to poor decisions tap room soon to be opening. I saw you guys rolling around on barrels today. That was hilarious. <laughs> soon to be opening when they're allowed to open. Again, thank you boys for the glassware. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the Orion's Belt glassware. And uh, looking forward to hearing some new content from you boys, hopefully soon. Oh, yeah. Same. Um, but, yeah, so I think now is a good time to just dive straight in um, to what the fuck is going on here. Um, so kind of first main topic I wanted to bring up and have us all talk about and i know cj you brought up some good statistics on this so if you want to chat first a little bit how many people are employed by restaurants who are out of work right now 
Um, how many people? Oh, I'm, you know what? I might have double statistics. Myself. I mean, I know that um, I know that right now the National Restaurant Association account uh, says yeah. about ten percent of our overall workforce, uh, and and restaurants right now are are taking the hit the hardest. And I want to say that uh, I think maybe I said. Um, one in three, one in one you in three, one in four people. One in four Brandon. workers that's applying for unemployment right now Our is a restaurant service worker. industry of of some form. Yes, yeah, service yeah. industry. So that that can extend to hotels, that can extend to restaurants, bars, um, breweries, wineries, um, and they're pretty you know they're pretty close affiliates. But yeah, uh, it's a. I mean, we make up uh, four to five percent of the gross GDP of this of this country, and uh, one. I mean, I think we have over thirty million people now on unemployment, and that's. That's not a hard number, right? Like we, there's, it's, it's happening so fast we can't count it. Yeah. But about one in three people are in some form of a service job. And that's my understanding of it based upon some um, things I've been reading with Forbes and with, uh, HuffPo and other things like that. So yeah. Well, and in the instance in of this podcast, we got three in three people. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Um, yeah. And, and for full disclosure, I am very, I'm very fortunate, um, to be on partial unemployment. <clears throat> I, I still get to work a little bit at the brewery and I still get to do, uh, the thing that makes me the happiest and uh, I guess do my job. And so I'm very, very fortunate for that. So um, I think it's important based upon any views that we we might discuss tonight that people know that is that, yes, I am, uh, by my definition, unemployed. I'm, I'm working less than half as much as I usually do based across two to three jobs. But uh, I, I still get a little bit of benefit and I'm very lucky that I get to work. So um, yeah. that's full disclosure from me. Uh, one in three people, though, right now. One in three people. And um, just to throw out some other facts there, right at the beginning of this conversation, um, the uh, NRA, the National Restaurant Association, not National Rifle Association, um, at the end of March, there were projections that up to um, that three percent of restaurants would not reopen at the end of this pre- um, predicament. And that number could jump as high as 11%. They were expecting 110,000 restaurants nationwide to close by the end of April. Um, I haven't been able to find any hard facts on what that actual number was. Um, but the projections at the end of March were that 110,000 restaurants would not last until the end of April. And that number is only going to keep going up the longer this quarantine lasts. So kind of where we're at right now. But um, being all three restaurant workers... What are your guys? I know Thomas. You've had some very interesting experiences with uh, unemployment. <laughs> yeah, we'll call them interesting for now. Um, if I mean, I, I understand why everything that's happened has happened, you know. And unfortunately, my my unemployment situation is. Uh, unique, according to uh, the people at unemployment, but it's it's hard to be like I've been out of work now for shit nearly nearly two months, and the f- the first thing that like I think about like just just the other day I was I was making dinner at home I like I pulled out my knife roll and like pulled my stuff out. And I was like, I grabbed all my knives. And I was like, I hope I remember how to fucking do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, I was like, I haven't, I haven't picked up a, a, a knife to like, you know, to, to, to prep anything in like nearly six weeks. I'm like, am I going to chop one of my fucking fingers off? Like, did I forget how to do this? Not that I actually forgot how to do it, but that's just like the mentality. It's like you're, you end up being out of practice and then you have to go back in not only to, um, like me, since I'm starting a new job, not only do I have to go into a new restaurant cold on the menu because I've never made it before, but I have to go in with my, my fucking, my hand skills, you know, my knife skills also in that, in that same boat basically now. It's like starting all fucking over again. And that can, that yeah. can be really infuriating. The, the, the unemployment thing is only frustrating because, uh, the, the special situation that surrounds, um, what was going on and basically I was <clears throat> was working two jobs in two different kitchens um, leaving both of those jobs to start full time work and benefits at a really dope <clears throat> brewery in Columbia Falls Backslope and uh, right as the transition like I had just finished 
my last day at my last job and like a day and a half later I found out that I wasn't going to be starting a new job because of all of this COVID stuff and all, you know, all this coronavirus nonsense. So, all right, no problem. You know, I'll, uh, I'll jump on and make sure that I file for unemployment. And then it turned into this whole shit show basically <laughs> because un- it, to, to unemployment, it looks like I just, cause I was never, uh, officially on the books at backslope. Um, so to unemployment, it just looked to them like I had quit two jobs, um, and was applying for unemployment within their six week, um, threshold, I guess is what they have. They have like a, a, a six week threshold that you can, if you quit a job, that's how long it takes before you can apply for, um, Unemployment afterwards, and then so the one thing got approved, and then another thing. Um, so I'm still waiting for a decision to be made. Like I haven't, like everyone else that I know um, that applied for unemployment, or most of everyone else I know. I know there are a lot of people out there that are still struggling to get all of their shit together um, and start getting um, paid properly for the time off. Um, but it's, I'm I'm basically just in in a fucking holding pattern, just flying in fucking circles, waiting for them to make a decision on basically whether or not I'm going to get paid for the last six to eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. An unfortunate predicament. I, I imagine a lot of people out there finding themselves in, I mean, there's, there's, um, we have a pretty under, um, and I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just I, I apologize if explaining that situation sounded really convoluted. It's just very hard to explain it's, all of the little. It's a very convoluted without, without situation. Without it, without it being like a yeah. Well, I mean, without it being like a 15 minute monologue of me explaining everything that happened. You know, <laughs> right. Like right. Well, and just we we have a we have a, a social system that's been ignored for a very long time and been very underfunded and been very diluted by. Uh, the government not believing, honestly, that, from my opinion, that social programs matter. And now you're going to see a lot of people who are going to struggle to get the basic benefits they, um, anticipated that they, they'd been paying into that system. They'd been, they'd been working yeah. in that system for so long. This is where the system is supposed to be the strongest. And it actually is proving it's one of the weakest. And, um, yeah. And, so, and that's the only reason that I'm being so diligent about this. Like, I'm financially okay, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I've got family and friends that have been helping me out and, you know, they understand what I'm going through. So they're not worried about, um, uh, payback at, at the moment until I start working again. You know, it's just that I need to stay on top of, like, this is, like, I want to be one of those examples of how, the system failed us in this time, you know, yeah. and not, not because I want to deal with all that shit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't want to have to fucking call <laughs> unemployment 65 times from two different phones to be able to get through to talk to a person to get well, some why, sort of why information. Not? <laughs> Cause that, you know, just like CJ saying, it's like, that's not how this fucking system no. is supposed to work. Like it's supposed to be here to help us. And all it's doing is infuriating. I would say 50 to 60 percent of the people that are trying to get their shit right yeah you know um yeah no it's it's a but it's insanely it's weird situation i know um in the state of oregon my mom who's a healthcare provider but a less essential one she's a physical therapist um but for the last six or seven weeks now she hasn't been able to see patients because all of her patients are old people with chronic pain uh, so obviously high risk. So she's been applying for unemployment. And about a week ago, we got an email that was like, Oregon is just now starting to process claims from, you know, these uh, self-employed individuals, which also includes a lot of restaurant owners and hair salon owners and that type of thing that have just been sitting with zero money for the last seven weeks, zero income, probably not a whole lot to fall back on in a lot of the cases. And, uh, the whole thing has just been a mess. Um, but I did want to like on the topic of restaurants and stuff, see, because you are, um, you know, half employed or quarter employed or whatever, 
level of employed. What's it like in the restaurant right now? I know you guys, you guys aren't doing takeout or uh, delivery, are you? We're not doing delivery. We are, we're, we're, we're doing pickup. We are doing okay. orders for pickup right now at the brewery that I work at. Um, and we are really proud to be doing that. Um, obviously, in our state of Montana right now, restrictions are being limited or, or are being lifted slowly to, to allow um, some. The, the, I mean, they're suggesting yeah, uh, that we could, by social distancing, open up the restaurant. To, today but was the first May day. May 4th, that... which is how serendipitous that we're having this episode on that. This was the and first May the 4th be with everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. May the 4th be with you all. <laughs> Before we forget to make our shameless um, cliche plugs, someday, someday when when people can find themselves back in uh, in the tap room again, they will see all my shameless plugs of the Star Wars universe because they're all over the board if you look hard enough. But um, I don't know if anyone can see, but right over there is a Lego Star Destroyer. <laughs> they can see it; it's just kind of blurry. Uh, but <laughs> yep, that is a Lego Star Destroyer. <laughs> Um, but so what's like the vibe been around the restaurant with the pickup orders and what has the conversation been like when you guys have started to talk about reopening and the potential of having to reopen at a limited capacity? Um, well, I, I think it's probably the conversation that's been happening with every small business owner in the service industry. And does I, that, does that make sense? I don't for, understand how it's going to happen. I, yeah, I that, know that restaurants right now, aren't designed to operate at 25% capacity. That's the thing. No, you know, no one's business model is designed to run at 25%. Right. And certainly not a, a, any kind of operation that is carrying perishable product that has to have a certain number of staff available to provide the service we ex- expect to provide. I am, I have been in the service industry since I was 18 years old. Um, full disclosure to any fans out there, I'm 33, which means uh, I'm coming up on half my life. I've got 15 years in the industry. Um, Never was I, would I ever have suspected that we would be going through this right now. This is easily the biggest crisis the service industry faces, uh, in my opinion, that, that it has in my lifetime. And, and that, that affects everybody. That affects um, the dishwashers. That affects the cooks. That affects the servers. That affects the bartenders. That affects the owners themselves, especially um, as I'm more concerned when it comes to small businesses. You know, the conversation that we've been having is – um, not only is it financially pertinent, but is it is it really socially or ethically responsible right now? Um, and you know, and I know that I know that this whole situation has been hard for everybody, but we do have to remember that um, that it's a very real situation, and we're not through it. You know, and we can't as a small business, and as a small business that is super stoked right now that we've had the support of our community, that that people are coming out and picking up growlers to go. And we've even had friends and family ask, like, can we buy a keg and put it out on our front lawn and play some tunes and offer it to people to come and fill up growlers uh, with a, you know, with a bottle of hand sanitizer. Like, uh, like that's, yeah. um, I, I, I've seen a lot of support, but it's, it's obviously again for these, especially restaurants, but breweries too face the same thing and, and, and all service industries, uh, bars as well. Like they're not set to operate at 25% capacity. That's not the business no. model. The business model is, a hundred percent capacity, you know, that's, that's how we have to work. And so it, uh, you know, if we, we are taking it day by day and we're looking at all precautions and all. <laughs> Everybody, uh, that's Gus. Gus wanted to chime in. His opinion is that it's very nice having humans. At hold home. on. Hold, hold, hold on a second. We seem to be having a canine debacle here at the house. Ah. <laughs> Gus is, Gus is throwing Sorry in his opinion the, that uh, he thinks it's nice having the humans at home all day. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, no, they're, uh, is he okay? Sorry about that. I wasn't, he was been, he's been so chill. I wasn't expecting Gus to, Things happen. Well, so well, you know, <laughs> the, the joys yeah. of doing a podcast anyway. when everyone's at home and not working. Um, yeah, yeah. See, the, <laughs> and these are some of the the things that happen. You know, yeah. Like, these uh, are indeed, and, and especially an unedited podcast like ours. Um, Let CJ yeah. get back on yeah, here you never, before you never we continue know the conversation. 
Yeah, it's not like it's, yeah, we're not we're not going to start over from this point. Um, no. But, um, uh, so CJ, now that you're back on, um, I was going to let you kind of keep going there, but um, another point I was going to bring up that I, I feel like we're in a nice point to transition into. Um, just to throw some more facts out at the people who are listening to all this. Um, Before you about, ask your question, when you poured that beer, it looked like motor, like it, like the viscosity of motor just, oil. It's just that sludge, just that sludgy goodness. Breakside double coconut stout. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> right, so, Josh, go right ahead, buddy. My bad. Um, yeah, so... You know, because you work at a brewery and you guys are dealing with this concept on a day to day basis and you, you know, people are talking about kegs and what they could do. Um, there's about 8,200 breweries in America. Um, predictions expect up to 60%, if not more of those breweries. If social distancing continues or if there's a second wave into July, uh, about 60% of those breweries might close their doors. And um, draft beer sales between selling cakes to restaurants or selling beer at your own tap rooms or brew pub accounts for probably about 20%, if not more, of a brewery's income. 20% of a big brewery, more of a small brewery. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of ad- adaptation that's having to happen right now. And I guess I'm curious. I, I know Bonsai has been doing some kind of to-go beer sales, but especially for uh, Backslope brewing how have you guys been like considering and adapting to that new sales model um again it's a it's a day-to-day conversation i mean we would like things to be back to normal but we also understand they're not um you know production is slowing down um we're not really at the size and scope we're talking about um buying cans or looking into going into packaging which some small breweries right now this is going to push them in that direction uh, which is, is to be understood, although um, it's kind of a weird situation of, of Rob and Peter to pay Paul because once you go distribution, you know, your profit margin drops anyway. We we depend on, on beer sales in the tap room. That's really what, where we're at. Um, but we're not willing to put profit uh, in front of um, in front of the, the, the what's what's right right now, which is, you know, we're – we're going to keep banging out and selling out the back door. You know, people can come up to the window and buy a growler and buy a meal, you know, and take it yeah. out and eat it. And that's just, that's where we're at. Um, you know, servers, servers at our restaurant have become, uh, you know, um, telephone operators and, and window people. And they're just you know, slinging it. And that's they're doing a great job. It's a weird transition for it's, them, too. It's strange. It's oh, strange. yeah. I'm assuming you know, that's, um, that's, significantly less in sales on a day to day basis. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Uh, I one of my things being the brewer and not an owner is I'm, I'm stoked to be privy to not the numbers. Um, I only get told when I'm not doing a good job. But, um, <laughs> but, but again, sale, uh, yeah, sales are down everywhere. Um, I think in the first, you know, in the first few weeks of this, we saw a 75 percent drop overall in in craft beverage in house sales. I'm pretty sure that statistic is something I've looked at. Um, we've slowly been getting it back a little bit through off premise and things like that, but um, obviously there's many metrics out there that can show you the demand has not gone down. Right, people in quarantine are still looking for craft beer. Um, people are still looking for craft beverage as a whole, but uh, the um, the ability to to kind of meet our our mark, if you will, on a day to day basis is it, it fluctuates. It really yeah. does. We. We are stoked to be paying some people and to keep people employed, and we are stoked to be serving the community. But this, um, in my opinion, and I know there's a lot of people um, that have been in the industry uh, with me and as long as I have that, you know, we'll see things slightly different. This will drastically change the face of dine-in and fine dining restaurants for a long time to come. Yeah. Can't can't not. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to think about, like, um, I – CJ, were you and I having this conversation the other day about like being served, or maybe it was me and you, Josh, uh, about being served by someone in a fucking medical PPE? Like someone's gonna walk up and like as as far as I know. Oh, I was just saying. I I don't know if we had that conversation, but I know I had that talk with my dad the other day. Yeah, I mean, like, how <laughs> are people like? You you can't as as far as I can read, and I've read um, 
a few of the um, regular rules and regulations that uh, the bars and restaurants here um, in Whitefish are implementing um, as per the reopening, like the Great Northern, for instance. Um, they limited seating. You can only sit at the tables available. You can't find a seat. You're not allowed to stay. Right. Um, Bartenders and servers will be wearing uh, some sort of face covering of some sort. You know, like everything's going to be brought to them at their table. You know, I I think about places like uh, Mama Blanca's and the Northern and uh, Mm -hmm. other small, like, bar restaurant type deals like that that are used to the high turnover, which I don't think you're going to experience for a while. Wow. And I mean, just like y- you can only go to the table in a four pack, you know what I mean? And they, you all have to be from the same, you know, you all have to live together. So if, if I go to the, to a restaurant, I literally have to sit by myself. Yeah. Okay. Unless I go with one of my roommates or something like, do you guys live? like, and think about the line of questioning, like the, the hostess has to ask, like if you walk in, you should be like, Oh, is it, 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 okay. There's, there's three of you. Okay. Are you all from the same house? Okay. We'll put you at this table. Okay. Well, you guys didn't come from the same house. So you can't sit together. Like, wait, what do you mean? I can't sit right. with my fucking friends. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 for, and for the, and for the record, and I'll jump in and say that it's, it's not, I think that we're, I mean, I know in any way that I'm arguing, those questions aren't valid right now. They very much are. It's just that you can't operate restaurants anymore the way that that we've known restaurants for the last hundreds no, of years. Yeah, hundreds exactly. of years. It's yeah, not exactly. the same experience. Um, we cannot we actually, can't have a, ta- a tavern anymore. We can't have a communal table right now. We can't do these things that, um, to me, having been in it for so long, are so romantic and innate to the industry. You what know, about the, what about the, the, like the sit down and share a beverage and drink and, and, and food with people? Uh, that's that's what we go to oh, do. What about the restaurants that are designed to be family style? That's I, right. You know, well, I, like, I, I don't unless, know. unless you're a family of four, I don't know how any model works right now. Um, and 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 again, I uh, that's not a, a a woe is me or woe is to any of the restaurants. Just specifically, that's a woe to the entire industry. I've, <laughs> I, I have friends in Louisiana. I have friends in New York. I have friends in. Oregon, Washington, California, all those service mm-hmm. industries. Um, and I know that other industries, obviously, uh, Chicago and other New England states and, 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 uh, and big states are being hit very hard. Th- yeah. This is, we, we don't know what, how to return to normal because <clears throat> the, the, it, it just doesn't exist right now. And you can't, you know, you operate, um, under a certain level of trust when you're in food service and when you're selling people product that you've prepared for them. It's really hard to establish that trust when there's always already the elephant in the room, which is this very real serious thing that we have going on in our society right now. That's COVID nineteen. Yeah. You can't. You can't. Uh, I mean, you can't. Again, you can't take someone who's meant to go from a two hundred seat every night capacity, you know, force them down to fifty, and also say, by the way, those servers have to give the most uncomfortable service of their lives. <laughs> you can't. It's you hard, can't hard to make tips that. when you can't smile through a face mask. Um, and this is that. actually uh, this is a topic I want to come back to. But before we totally move away from you being at the brewery, uh, um, you you did say an interesting point, which is something I was kind of going to bring up tonight. Anyways, considering I am drinking canned boneyard beers, which is something that hasn't existed until after coronavirus shut us all down. Um, that that concept of adapting and uh, what you're doing with it, because you, you did mention that a lot of breweries are kind of moving towards that. And Boneyard's an interesting case where they literally only had a tap room and keg sales for the longest time, um, and it was only no I think within room. what? No, no tap room. No, they they had a tap room. You could go into their brewery and get a growler fill, um, and get a taster, but. A tap room in Oregon is a lot different than a tap room in Montana. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was gonna say like the the idea of a tap room to me is a place where you can like not necessarily having yeah. like fifty different taps or whatever, but like Bonsai's no. tap room has twelve or sixteen uh, or whatever uh, it is. What what Montana yeah. considers a tap room, like what Bonsai has, that's like a brew pub in Oregon. Um, okay, 
a tap room in Oregon for a brewery is like you can't serve pints of beer, but you can serve tasters and you can fill growlers to go. Um, and so a brewery can have all their beers on tap at their tap room in their brewery. They're not serving meals. They're not serving pints and stuff. Um, but you can serve beer to go and you can give people tasters. And so for the longest time, Boneyard had, had a little tap but room you walk, their brewery. But you walk through a door into the brew pub and you can sit down and have all of their beers and full pints with food. Um, well, if a, like a, a brewery like Boneyard, they didn't have a brew pub, right? So they served... They sold kegs to no, restaurants. I, no, 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 no. I, I no, I get that. I'm just oh. saying, like, if you have, yes, if you have, if you have a pub associated with it, then you can, you can obviously yeah. sell. I mean, so and things that, it, you would have just trying to, to try to, it's, it's just trying to figure out like that, that first cousin twice removed part. I'm just like, wait, right. what? Why don't you just call it what it is? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so you would have one or the other. You would have a brewery with a tap room attached to it. Or you would have a brewery with a pub attached to it or a brew pub separate from your brewery and maybe a tap room at your brewery. So the brew pub, like if, if you were on location and you had a spot where you could sit down and eat food, you just had a brew pub attached to it. And so people wouldn't go into the tap room to taste and buy beer. They would just go to the bar in the brew pub. Um, right. If you just have a tap room attached to it, that means you don't have that liability of having to have a certain number of meals to provide to people. Uh, you don't have that liability of serving pints of beer to people and getting people intoxicated and whatnot. You just have to check IDs before you sell them a growler. You give them a certain number of tasters. Um, gotcha. I just I just wanted to yeah. clarify. We we can get back yeah. to the main topic though. Total separation. Cause, I mean, every state's a little different with that. I was so confused for the longest time living in Montana how breweries operated out there. <laughs> um, but um you know so boneyard they they just had a tap room attached to their brewery for the longest time and they sold mostly just kegs of beer to restaurants and then just recently like right like maybe two years ago uh they opened up a pub for the first time um because the owner he just didn't want to do that and so now they just opened their pub and they're celebrating their 10th anniversary in like a month i think so Eight years into being open, they finally opened a pub, which in Oregon, most breweries have a pub. Um, and then just now, they're so they, they've done everything just a little bit backwards. But coronavirus shut them down and they lose the bulk of their sales because 90% of what they do is selling kegs to the local restaurants, pouring beer on tap at their own restaurant, right? So like that's how they make their money. So now they have a canning service. Now they're canning beer to go, which is awesome because now I'm drinking a hop of wheelie in my trailer at home, not out of a um, growler. But <laughs> well, and 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 this brings up the point that I was making in the uh, the the, the, the pre show meeting about um, <clears throat> not everything that's going to come out of this situation is necessarily bad. You know, there are yeah. like there are some people that are um, like in the case of Boneyard that are unfortunately reaping some of the benefits that are being caused by this situation. You know what I mean? Like they're, they, 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 Look they at were the being opportunity. forced. Yeah. Like they were being forced to can. You know what I mean? Like there are other businesses in like this, the same in in the same respect that we'll have the option to uh, find a new lane, you know what I yeah. mean? Like something that they weren't going to do, but now they're forced to do it. So now it's like when this is all over with, does <laughs> Boneyard continue to can and just have like I would a imagine. canning line come up, you know? So now they've, and now they've created another outlet source, yeah. you know what I mean? For income for themselves. Maybe something they, that they weren't ready to do, but they got pushed into because of the situation. So not, I mean, it's like ninety five percent bad, but there's gonna be there's gonna be some <laughs> some good that will come out of this for certain businesses and for certain people as well. You know what I mean? For individuals, like I've seen so many fucking people riding their bikes and running up and down this street. Like people are forced to stay at home. They're getting bored. So what do they do? They go outside and they start walking. They're like, all right, well, walking's boring. I might as well start running. All right, well, running's boring. I might as well ride my bike. Um, and then all of a sudden they're in fucking shape again. So there's, you know, oh yeah, it's, it's um, just kind of like, that's where my, 
so my crazy brain goes. to kind of continue, you know, what happens after this, you know, where, where does this go? And what you guys were already talking about, um, I was reading an article, um, before this podcast, just getting ready for it, that, um, that lighting looks way better. <laughs> Josh, the lighting looks better. Um, so I was reading an article that was basically referencing, you know, the potential of the service industry entirely changing from this whole thing, which obviously we know, like we're not going back to just straight up normal service anytime soon. Not anytime um, soon. Not anytime soon. But that no, being I, said, I, I, yeah. normal service in the service industry, I think we can all agree was extremely fucking flawed, right? You have people working for minimum wage, if not close to it. I'm, I'm sure as a brewer, you probably made a little above minimum. I'm not going to ask what you made on a public podcast. We it don't was a little bit, a little bit above minimum. It's just a little bit above um, minimum. <laughs> and you know, the average line cook makes probably between 11 to $15 an hour, maybe up to 20 if they're in a really fucking bougie restaurant, right? Bartenders usually probably getting paid minimum wage plus a fuckload of tips, uh, unless they're at a nice spot that takes a little better care of them. But the odds of finding health care when you're working in a restaurant of getting like, you know, health insurance through work, any kind of extra support, retirement plans, that type of shit. I know there's some places like McMinimins does a really good job of taking care of their employees. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Backslope offered some sort of health plan. Um, I don't know. Maybe you can correct me on that, but uh, uh, again, I, I, right now I would always say I'm very fortunate for both both companies I work for out here in the Flathead Valley, Bonsai Brewing Project and Backslope Brewing, do a great job yeah. of taking care of their employees. But um, you know, through my career, uh, I've been fortunate enough at times to work. Usually, the jobs I didn't want to work were the jobs that had the best benefits. Um, they yeah. weren't necessarily creating interesting food or making interesting beer, but they had great benefits. Or the trade off is you go and work somewhere that you're very passionate to work for, and they don't have that. Um, but on the whole, I would say that, um, no, that, that service industry See, does not. I found not... Like the exact opposite. Like, in, in just in my <laughs> personal experience, at least in the last, like, three months, anyway. You know, well, that's, I, I guess yeah. that's relative to where you've worked and, and where, you know, where you've been. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've just worked I, at shitty restaurants. I, I've got, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I could, I could count, uh, right now the number of places I've worked. I've just, I've jumped around a lot. I've, I've tradesmen a lot. I've tried to learn a lot of things from a lot of different people. Um, well, no, I was just saying that, like, personally to me, like, when I get to work at Backslope, it will be a place where, like, the food is probably some of the best that, I'll, that, that I've made in the last, you know, few years at least. Yeah. And they've got benefits. Um, so there's that. Anyway, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, it's um, okay. It's okay. And I appreciate the hype for the, the restaurant. Uh, my, where I was going with that is, um, is more that, uh, there, there's, there's a, a large workforce out there right now that works overtime, works hard jobs, works jobs that a lot of people don't want to do. And no, we don't, we don't usually have a lot of medical. We don't usually have dental. Yeah. We don't usually have a 401k offering. There are rare pockets of that. Yes. And those, those companies are doing great jobs. And, and, um, again, uh, uh, through a long time of hustling, I'm lucky to find myself in one, but, um, but looking at, you know, the people, this, that the situation is affecting the service industry. And again, it, it always is going to fall on the lowest to low, the dishwashers, the bus boys, um, the, the long career service people, they don't, there's, there's never been really much of a plan for this. This, these yeah. industries are based upon, on high turnover, or I mean, high turnover rate of tables and, and slinging drinks and, and, uh, and we, we're a gratuity based industry. Like they, it boils yeah. down to that. Uh, we, the, our, our employer does not usually pay most of our income. Well, and most so of our income, for us to be sorry, Josh. Let me finish this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Finish our income for us to be hitting like a median point of of good. It it's all based on gratuity. It's all based on human connection, and it's all based on us putting time in with people and and doing service. And when we don't have that opportunity, it does it does become very difficult. You know? Exactly. I know that for, I'm speaking more more for those that can't find any employment right now. I'm speaking more for the again the. Wonderful people in in the shittiest positions in restaurants that I've worked with and for for a very long time. There, yeah, it's it's a struggle. Well, and so that's kind of the point um, this article is making is you know a lot of us in restaurants we've we've been in that position. We've all been in that position, and restaurants don't have a contingency plan for this. I mean, if you're looking at three to eleven percent of restaurants closing their doors entirely because of this one pandemic. 
that means those restaurants were living paycheck to paycheck the same as their employees were. Um, margins yep. have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over the years. And restaurants expect the guests to pay the paycheck of the employees at this point. And maybe this is an opportunity, you know, coming out of COVID-19, coming out of this lockdown and this pandemic, we could entirely reshape the restaurant model to a point where restaurants are paying their employees well, covering healthcare, taking care, like, because we weren't considered essential workers, right? Like restaurants got shut down. All of us got put out of work to some degree or another. But now think about how much everyone's missing food, how much people are like, I can't cook for myself. People are yeah, just like whatever. hoping I for takeout had, options. I would think that like we are essential workers. Unfortunately, places like restaurants, bars, breweries, wineries, cideries, whatever, whatever you got going on, they are the biggest contributors to gatherings of large people. Yeah. Correct. You know what I Correct. mean? And that's like, it's not that like, yeah, service industry people are absolutely essential, especially given, you know, the numbers that CJ was talking about earlier being 4% of the fucking, the, uh, gross national, yeah. Or gross domestic products. Yeah. The, the, the GDP. Yeah. Uh, so, restaurants generate $2.5 trillion dollars of a $20 trillion GDP. Pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah. So we are, I think, essential. It's un- it's just unfortunate that our businesses are based on the gatherings of large groups of people. Well, yeah. So, and, and the weird irony isn't it, isn't it kind of um, if I can tangent real quick how, how please do um, un- unfortunate we are uh, important. I mean, uh, like the based upon our. And I could go all night on this, and I try. I will try not to. Based upon where we are at, at, agriculturally and um, and as a society, uh, a lot of people don't know what to do in a quick sec to prepare food for their family. A lot of people don't know anymore the access to good ingredients and to wholesome preparation. Um, we we've become a, a society of convenience, and now COVID nineteen is really testing that convenience because okay. because conveniency is gone. It's not a it thing. Is. Yeah. So now and 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 you know. Um, I'll gloss over, you know, uh, the hoarding, which you shouldn't do. You don't need to do. I'll gloss <laughs> no, 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 over. The, I was the, just, the, the, just kind of laughing at the idea. People, of like, but we we are a culture of convenience, and 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 don't you know? I I'm I'm playing the piper here. Like I've I've made my 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 living as a service industry person on um, providing convenience. Um, when that's not able to be provided anymore, we're we're the models change, and it um, it. A big worry of mine is it's going to undo a lot of the good that the that the locality movement has done, and a lot of the the, the movements that um, restaurant industries have done over the years, which is which is to try and push people into a into a uh, perspective of eating better and at least acknowledging what you're eating. But you know, again, to go back to that one house movement, I think as they call it, Josh, where there's no a no tipping system, um, it. It's really hard to explain to somebody why they they used to pay thirty bucks for a steak and now they're paying fifty five. Um, it's because we've we've devalued our product for so yeah. long and we've tried to find ways to be to be cheaper for so long and tried to find ways to you know again um, cover the pay. restaurants don't pan out right now in the current situation. I mean you like they well, they're very tough. They're very tough. Um, but I think right now would be the time to make that huge pressure because when you talk when you tell anybody about Let's move away from tips. You're like, well, how do you justify this huge jump in prices on your product, right? Right. Right now, there's that. It, it, it wouldn't be entirely honest to say it, but there's that easy excuse of prices jump yeah, because a, of coronavirus. Four dollar. Yeah, we're a four dollar craft beer suddenly becomes a six dollar craft beer. Right. We got to cover our costs because I'm not, coronavirus I'm not, happened. <laughs> I'm not arguing that it, I'm not. I'm not arguing that it shouldn't have been. And it, 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 uh, you know, my 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 thought is always just like that. That this this is showcasing how we've devalued this product for so long. I mean, yeah. it, it does take a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. And I'm not. Again, I'm I'm speaking less right now on the beer perspective um, than I am on the restaurant side of things. But um, I know I know food very well, and I know, um, you know, from from farm to plate. There's a lot of things that get left out in that in that four dollar price tag. You know, there's a shitload of things that just get left out, um, and we're feeling that now. And the people that have gotten left out are feeling it more now than ever. 
Um, the, like, like you pointed out with the supply chain issue, Josh, with like, with, with Boneyard not being able to, like, they, they built their whole model off selling cakes to restaurants and establishments that don't yeah. right now have any chance to sell. So the supply chain is, is, is broken there. Um, and it works the same in the restaurant industry when you talk about, um, just, you know, with, uh, I, I've been lucky to work for a lot of people uh, that support small farmers. So these small restaurants are shuttered, which means those small farmers aren't selling their products either. Yep. Um, it's uh, heartbreaking and it's, it's really hard. And, um, you know, it does, I think where you're going with this, Josh, is it does paint our industry and our society right now in a very interesting light. Um, this I think, whole thing, I mean, it, it's illuminating all the weaknesses I see that we have. And I think it gives it's us a good chance to broader. change that, you know, a good chance to reevaluate and so. come out of I this in a so. better place. And I will say just on a positive note with that whole thing, I know a lot of restaurants that are now still ordering from their food service providers and they're acting as a grocery store for their customers. Um, they're ordering their bulk meats and breads and everything. And the people who don't want to go to a grocery store or can't find what they're looking for can order from can a restaurant, restaurant instead. And both the breweries that I work for in the Flathead Valley have done that, have offered their, their purveyorship buyer power to their, uh, at least to their employees. Yeah. Um, and even in terms of paper goods, but in terms of, you know, dried goods and things like that, um, uh, which is amazing. You know, any, any, I'll just say it to shout anyone who's stepping up right now and using what a little, I guess, benefit or edge they might have to help others. Mad shout out. And while I'm on it, mad shout out to, um, all first responders, all all people who are working in close Seriously. Contact situation. Yeah, that's a huge thing. First and, and, responders, you know, doctors, nurses, we, hospital workers. Yep, the people we are on the front lines and grocery podcast. stores, even you know. Yep, groceries. Thank you, grocery store workers as well. We are a a, a craft beer focused and service industry focused podcast. That does not mean in any way that we don't recognize right now. You know, there I, is a hundred other industries interesting, out there who are doing this shit too. Yeah. I read a very interesting piece of information, and. uh Again, we can't uh, we can't believe everything we read on the internet. But I read something that there are somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty five hundred Costco's uh, nationwide, give or take, and they employ about three point five million people across. I, I believe that across thirty five hundred, you know, so each place has about a thousand employees. Wait, that doesn't seem right. There's uh, anyway. 785 Costco stores nationwide. Number of employees is 254,000. Or maybe, maybe it's – well, Costco is Costco worldwide? I don't have the answer to that question. I, w- I would assume so, but I don't – that also seems like it could be something that's just so American that it's only us. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> um, either way. That th- yeah, I don't know. But so there's a fuckload of them. You said there's 780? 780 with 250,000 employees. Okay. So 250,000 employees. And I guess not a single employee has been diagnosed with coronavirus. Again, that could be very wrong. Wow. But I, I think it's Costco and the, the parent companies or the parent company that owns it and it's all, all it's, I don't know who owns Costco, but aren't they, isn't it like a Walmart company or something? Might be. Uh, I don't, I, I don't want to speak out of, uh, my ass here. I <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't look into that. Um, yeah. I do know, I do know that, uh, that, uh, a very high level Amazon, uh, VP, uh, resigned today publicly based upon the fact that Amazon is not taking care of its workers in a way that need like at this time period, which is pretty huge. Are you fucking you know, serious? Yeah. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to get too shit. deep into this conversation. Um, I've got a lot of very strong feelings about Amazon and, uh, their higher ups, but to anyone interested in a, uh, very interesting wealth scale dichotomy, um, you should look into, uh, oh, that's a shitty fucking URL. Um, I'm not going to say that, but just look up, uh, the, the 400 <laughs> richest Americans wealth visualization. Um, and it, it's a, it's a really interesting number to look at. And Jeff Bezos is very well 
brought into that. <laughs> Thank you. To be, to be, I, w- I, ju- I was just asking CJ to save me a little bit of this. Oh, a little bit, yeah, good call. A little bit of, yeah. Just speaking of I that, didn't, I didn't I'm gonna get me another beer. Get a beer, get nice. a beer. When times Excellent. get blue, I reach for strong, dark imperial stats. It yeah. just carries me over. I did not want to break COVID rules, so I asked him to save me a sip out of the bottle after he poured himself a glass. Fair enough, and I always will. So, um, you know, cheers. No, I'm just kidding. Well, um, um, I think, I don't know, I, we, we covered everything that I kind of had planned out for the episode um, as the host of the whole thing. Is there any other points and topics either of you would like to bring up while we're still here the, chatting? The inordinate amount of people comparing coronavirus to the <laughs> flu. Um, my uh, highly intelligent, very thoroughly researching cousin, uh, Vinny. Shout out if you ever listen to this V. Sub V. Um, Sub V. Um, turned uh, or posted an article on Facebook the other day that talked about how trying to compare the the way the flu affects the world and how coronavirus is affecting the world is basically like trying to compare apples and oranges. Before you so, continue with that, I'm just going to shout out those numbers real quick. Uh, so it makes that much more sense as you talk about the description from that article. Um, let's see here. Currently in the United States, there are about 1.2 million coronavirus cases with just about 70,000 deaths. Worldwide, there's 3.65 million cases with little over 250,000 deaths. Um, In America, there's approximately 24 to 62,000 flu deaths in the last flu season, which is October to April. Um, And worldwide, there is about 166,000 flu deaths this year. So if you want to keep going and uh, talk about the facts of that article. So... First of all, uh, you're already looking at a difference of about 100,000 people in deaths versus coronavirus versus the flu in what I would assume is going to be about the same amount of time, given that we don't actually know when coronavirus started infecting people and or murdering people. So October seems like a good fucking place to start. Yeah, I'll Um, be right back, by the way. Yep, for sure. So, in that same amount of time, you've got an, a, a uh, an additional hundred thousand people that have been killed by the coronavirus. The problem, and this article brings it up, and it's on the Washington Post, and you can look this up. Um, the article is called. I should, probably should have brought this up before I started talking about it. Um. Stupid fucking phone. The article is called There's a More Accurate Way to Compare Coronavirus Coronavirus Deaths to the Flu. It's an article um, by Christopher Ingram, I believe. Anyway, it, it talks about how the number of... Americans affected with the flu and the deaths related to that infection are kind of kind of fudged in a, in a way because the if and I'm not I, let me see if I can find it. I, in somewhere in the article they they talk about how the the number of reported deaths could be somewhere between seven and fifteen thousand. Um. For, just for remembering just from States. the article, uh, it was essentially they know that the confirmed flu deaths are less than the actual, but they don't really know by how much. So they inflate the number an insane amount 
with a mathematical formula to try to estimate. Yeah, and, and that, that's that's what I was getting to. So they basically take the number of confirmed cases um, reported by hospitalizations or doctors or whatever. They put that number through an algorithm. It pumps out an arbitrary number, basically, that gives an estimated because there's an undercounting, you know, because not everyone goes to the doctor. Not everyone, not everyone that gets diagnosed dies. Not everyone that, uh, so there, there's, there's a whole bunch of other factors. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when they get to that, so they put the, this number from the, the reported debts through this, this algorithm and they, they come up with an arbitrary number, which gives you a roundabout estimated figure of how many people potentially died from the flu that year. So what Josh is talking about being that the <clears throat> flu may have killed 160,000 people last year, but that could be post algorithm where the reported number is maybe only 80 to 90,000. You know what I mean? There's that because the CDC is, I don't, I don't, it, it, is it's, it just U.S.? It's the, the CDC is just U.S. Yeah. And but a lot of these numbers come from the World Health, the world, the, the WHO or the yep. World Health Organization yeah. also. So I'm assuming that those numbers get pumped through that same fucking alg- algorithm or for at the least WHO, a similar one or a sure. similar one for the WHO. Yeah. So you end up with this arbitrary number of a figure that's a lot larger than it may potentially well, actually be. It could also be smaller, but at the same time, well, you we know, don't know. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> However, the corona and this is what the article explains too is that the coronavirus gives you an act like as far as we know from the first uh uh from the first moment of recognition of the virus and testing and all of that, it gives you a there has been nothing but ac- well, supposedly yeah. accurate numbers being if pumped anything, it's at you. undercast. <laughs> it's undercast, whereas the flu numbers are overcast. Yeah. So again, it it brings it. That's why he brings up the whole like apples and oranges thing. Right. 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 Yeah. You know? that, yeah. So well, and it's I think this I think the scariest thing about all this again is that we 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 don't know. I mean, the, the, yeah. we talk about again uh, weaknesses that we're illustrating in our society. Um, and someone brought up a good point to me. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off and I'll, I'll let you continue your thought. And then I want you guys to kind of run with this one too. But what about the idea of, you know, we're supposed to be self quarantining and staying home and staying away from people and trying to limit the spread of the virus. How is our immune system supposed to build an immunity to it? If, we're not exposing people to it. And that's a very touchy fucking topic. That's, touchy. that's, I, touchy. that's a very yeah. touchy topic. And I know that a lot of people are not going to be comfortable with, with what I just said. But at the same well, time, it's like, that's how your body builds self immuniza- self immun- immunization barriers to things like the coronavirus. I guess uh, to uh, the common cold is technically a coronavirus. It's not yeah. COVID-19, but it, it is a coronavirus. Right. We still get sick from it, which makes me think that we're never going to find a cure for this coronavirus. But if we don't expose <laughs> ourselves to it, we're, we're never going to allow our bodies to try and create natural antibodies to fight it off so that future generations, like those of us that are making it through that have been exposed to it, will create the antibodies so that if this comes around again, we'll be okay as opposed to, you know, people like my friend's grandmother who caught coronavirus and fucking passed away. Yeah. You know what I mean? I guess um... so. There is there is a an unfortunate fine line where like I don't know cough on me fuck it <laughs> I guess I guess the balance comes down to um and part of the struggle that I think we're having from it's weird I I really don't love the news I don't love following this type of shit um, but my parents watch the news all the time so I've I've been exposed to a lot more of this Still lately. Mine. Uh, being that I'm living with my parents during the pandemic. <laughs> um, it, uh, I, I think the, the difference lies in, you know, the flu, like we were talking about, it kills significantly less confirmed people a year than the coronavirus. There, there's a huge discrepancy there. 
Um, but the, the idea with the social distancing is not necessarily based around the idea of herd immunity. Like, yeah, it would be really great if we could build that herd immunity in our population. Um, but in America, as sad as it is to say, we just don't really have the testing right now, right? Like, our testing numbers are not like the the tests per million they're, they're of people. They're very low. We're, they're we're very pretty low. low in the world count. I was looking at it earlier. I think we're somewhere around thirtieth in the world, and that's like all world countries, not just developed nations. So that's not like a great number. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the num- so we don't so know that's who why, has that's it. why you're talking. But that. But, also, like we don't want the, the the issue is. But now you but now you're bringing up the point of you know possibly again being undercounted. Well, the, you know, the issue like, is especially for well just for just for the U.S. I'm not talking about yeah. worldwide. Like if we are 30th among testing, but yet, like what is what is the U.S. What's our like, actual as count as a percentage wise? <laughs> like what is what know, is our we, actual um, like population percentage? Like there are three hundred twenty eight million people in the U.S. Right, there are right. six billion people on the planet, yeah. or something like that. We we've tested so, about seven million people. Um, so not even not even really much of five yeah. percent of our population. Um, but the, the big really thing right is now. like that's a rough number for me to do on the on the on the spot, but. Herd immunity would be great if we could be testing people to make sure that either you've had it, you've survived it, or you haven't had it and you need to get it. But it would be fine if we had that and we could know like us three were of that age group that we'd probably be okay if we got exposed to it. Might have a week of suck. Might even be a little bit worse. Some people would die, which would really, you know, be extremely unfortunate. But because we don't know but who Darwinism. is or isn't who, who is or isn't exposed to it? <laughs> who has or hasn't had it? For example, my grandma is having a huge dispute with her neighbor right now over a property line. So we have to go over there on a pretty regular basis and help her out. And my mom, you know, like I said earlier in the episode, she sees chronic pain elderly patients who are extremely susceptible. So if I started going out because I wanted to get that herd immunity but I could never be sure if I had it or not because I couldn't get tested for it. I could bring it home, give it to my mom. She could not show any symptoms. And then she could spread it to every single one of her patients and my grandma. If I could get tested and be out and doing my things, but get a somewhat regular test, then I could know like, oh shit, I've got it now. I'm just going to sit down in my camper and quarantine for a few weeks until I'm not spreading it anymore, until I'm not contagious. That would be fine. But... The idea of us. Unfortunately, you have the mentality (laughs) and the intelligence to, to, to discern right from wrong and stay in your trailer. Whereas most people, I think, unfortunately, the, the actual herd isn't smart enough (laughs) to do that. So I love the idea of herd immunity, but it's hard to put into practice without putting a lot of people in a lot of risk and killing a huge chunk of the population. And I would like to think that our society is smart enough and developed enough to not be lemmings. And that being said, I'm not sure if it is, but I'd, I'd like to think that we are. Um, and maybe it's a, and maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's a little nihilistic, I man. But I would not be I know, upset I know, if you know, know myself but, included, but, but if part of the population not, decided not, to just not that I'm not that it'd I'm be good for the to, planet. I'm not going to. I'm not going to disagree with that statement. I'm not going to jump in and say and and defend uh, humanity here because. Um, I but have, at the same time, I want to make a quick point. Whether or not it's good for the planet, the planet's going to supersede us regardless. That's true. Like the, the planet has lived through every organic life form that has walked on it for the last two point five billion years. Okay, at the end of the day, or the planet two hundred fifty billion in space. years, well, or however fucking old the universe is. The planet is the planet knows it, not the planet as we know it, though. Right? The planet yeah. as we yeah. know it is is in for is in for a real big reality. <laughs> it's in for a ride. <laughs> it's gonna it's, it's gonna turn into Mars. And then, you know, the species is going to show up on another fucking so Like, we're just going to jump around. We're going to show up somewhere else, man. Right. Man, I could, get, I could get Space very, dust. uh, um, oh, I can't even think of the word for it right now. Uh, philosophical. I could get very philosophical on that topic. Like, you know, why does it even matter if the whole planet dies and everything on life dies? None of us are going to care because we're all going to be dead. But uh, that's a whole. That's even. Other that's topic. super nihilistic. That's way <laughs> even more nihilistic than I was talking about. Like, yeah, I'm going to be dead, so I don't really give a shit. 
but at, at the, the end of the day, time, everything does. Except maybe cockroaches. Those bastards live through everything. <laughs> Croc- crocodiles and birds. I'd have to find there. There was so they just found another organism that apparently regenerates in a way that it technically is a single set organism that's lived for the eternity of its life. Technically, lobsters so I, are in a way they can don't we be all immortal live for the eternity of well, our lives. Well, that's a that's a play to three for a whole another episode. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, no, someone, that's, someone that's, write that topic down. I think we should have Plato fours when we have guests with totally random topics and or just random topics we want to talk about from time to time. That's for Plato. For Plato is the is the eat mushrooms and listen to this podcast. Yeah, yeah. For we should jump. For we should definitely jump. Random it, shit. Jump, <laughs> jump it even further. This is twenty four Plato. <laughs> Four twenty Plato. Just, just, just get right into the 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 fucking viscousy thickness. Well, diving <sighs> diving back into the original um, serious topic we were on, um, if I can, we we all agree, you know, testing and lack of testing is a huge issue right now. We don't. Yeah. We, th- th- there's not a person right now who really. I mean, even even infectious disease experts are admitting that there is a l- very big lack of understanding of what's happening. Yeah, right every, everyone's getting a lot of this right now, and <laughs> that 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 to well, me settles back down to small businesses can't. You know, if you have to and you're going to try and do it the best you can, I, I totally understand. I'm not condemning you, but ethically, we really can't reopen right now. And that's a bummer. I, I want yeah. to get back to doing the things that I do. I think we all do. To, you know, we, I know we all do. I know we all I'm do. I'm tired. I think I'm starting to get bed sores. You know, but it, <laughs> is it, is it the right, you know, can we allow, we, we talk about herd mentality. Is it the right thing to allow, the wants of everybody to outweigh Super what's right for needs. everybody, you know, supersede the, the needs. Exactly. And, and, um, what is it? Uh, I the go Star back Trek to rule, the you know, needs, the needs of the many outweigh violate the, the need of the few or the one. Right. Yeah. Don't violate the prime directive. Yeah. The prime you, directive. I mean, it, it, That's to, the one. To, to the li- to the, to the 17 listeners that we have right now, 17 listeners, 70 people listen to the show. I think we got think like we four subscribers on YouTube. Tight. One that's of them like, is me. It's like, all right. <laughs> I don't. I don't even. I haven't checked Anchor in a couple. If of you days. are stoned and bored enough to be listening to this show, look, we appreciate know this you. One thing. We appreciate you. Know this other thing. Um, hang on, man. We're all going through this ride together. Uh, you know, and that's the as we talk about COVID nineteen as a service industry upset. I will say that to again to y'all as as good friends of mine and people that I've worked with and spoken with about the service industry. I will. I, I, I will say that to the numerous people I've met in my life through 15 years in this business, everyone's having a shitty time. And, and, and yeah. there's, there's some of us, there's some of us that are having more of a shitty time than others. Um, you know, we didn't even get a chance on this episode to point out the disparities right now in the service industry between minorities and, 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 um, and, and non-minority. Uh, the, there is a pretty significant thing as always these catastrophes hit, um, you know, harder at people more than ever, but yeah. it, everyone is going through something. Everyone is um, struggling with something right now, and I hope that we can all remember that as we try and get through it for ourselves and for our families and remember to be courteous and to take care of everybody else around us too as much as you can. Uh, if it makes sense to leave that 25% tip, tip instead of that 20 right now, do it for the service industry workers. Be kind to each um, other. Be kind to each other. Take care don't, of each other. Don't stomp on people's fucking positivity. It's not necessary right now. Don't yeah. run them out of the room. Um, don't make them throw their headphones. I'll if, do it too. If you guys don't mind, I think that's a fantastic note to end on. We're at about an hour and a half almost. So uh Yeah, we get a lot of info. Um <laughs> Yeah, we're getting, we're, we're getting yeah, close. We're, we're coming up, we're coming up on there. Yep, um so close. I guess just uh one last note before uh we wrap it up. I think on behalf of all three of us, I'm safe to say that we appreciate everyone out there who's working right now, be you a delivery driver or an ER nurse. Um from the simplest thing to the most intensive things, you know, every, everyone's doing their part. We appreciate all of you and everyone out there who's, you know, in our situation being quarantined at home and either working part time or none at all. Um, you know, hang in. We'll all get through this together and hopefully we find a new normal that's better than the normal we knew before. Um, we are all in this together. Amen. Um, on behalf of myself, the Viking Peaches, Josh. Cousin T, Thomas, the Groovy Bear, CJ. Um, thank you for listening, as always. Um, Appreciate it, you four people. 
Virt- you, virtual you, high, you fives, four, five, high fives, air high fives all around. Yeah, uh, we lo- we love you all, and just stay safe and stay healthy out there. Don't kill your grandma today. <laughs> and uh, as as always, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to leave comments, ask questions. We will be more than happy to get to them on whichever episode you on a play-doh for sometimes like, like <laughs> whatever comes not, next. Not, i'm more than happy to answer anyone's questions at any time as long as it's yeah. in the middle of things you know yeah. absolutely um so you know get a get a hold of us um especially this last episode you know give us let us know what your feedback like give us what, what are you going you know, through talk to us yeah we'll what do you talk to like tell us your stories like what have you been dealing with like we want, we want to hear, you know, just like it, it's good to, it, it's cathartic to be able to talk yep. to a, a non or an unbiased party. Send us a topic right now. You I mean, know? This is a very weird thing if you're in the industry. Yeah. Talk to us about, about your experiences, what you're going through. We, yeah. We, yeah. We're more happy to bring that up on the. If, if you want to be on with us, like get a hold of us, let us know. Like we, we'd be more than happy to have you on and talk to us while we all kind of go through this super fucking weird time together, you know, like seriously, we w- we would love to have that conversation with you. Well, then if we're hitting that point, I will say cheers to you, gentlemen. Cheers. I don't cheers with an cheers empty glass, but cheers, cheers to everybody and, out uh, there and uh pieces and chicken there. greases. That's right. Uh, again, one more quick shout out to anyone frontline from a grocery store worker to a nurse who is still employed and also still doing, uh, work that benefits others while putting yourself at risk. That is huge. So yeah. Cheers. Thank you. You're the uh, fucking Robert. heroes right now. I also want to, I want, I want to do a, a verbal thank you to 20 grand for letting us use tracks off of their new record. God, not I my hate work. those guys. Oh, they're there's so the many other bastards. It's, it's that just, not good. Good. just man. Yeah. E-rock. Vinny, uh. Rebecca, <laughs> it's Eric, not good. it's not good. Kendra, Toby, I, I, Matt, just, Jamie. I will never miss it's riding just, with E-Rock early in the morning at sunrise. Fuck shit, that. Did I, did I, did I miss anyone? <laughs> I don't know. There's it's so, such a big band of musicians. There's like nine Zach. Of them. Oh, I, for, I forgot Zach. I can't forget Zach. I can't forget about Zach. All right, play that track, homie. Let's get out of here. Play that funky track. Let's go. Here we go. Thanks, y'all. We'll catch you next time. New installment onto a new Play-Doh one and a new tasting episode next time. Tune in, and uh, we will see y'all next time around. The Groovy Bear. Cousin T. The Viking Peaches. I'm trying to point the right way, so make sure that the video goes in. (laughs) We'll catch y'all next time. Bye-bye. You.